Today, we're going to take a look at 3JS. Oh, and hey, I'd like to mention this video's sponsor, Skillshare.com. Now, it's a brand new year here in 2019, and Skillshare will help keep you learning and thriving as they offer 25,000 different classes in coding, design, business, and more. For instance, you're about to watch my tutorial that utilizes a JavaScript library, but you could watch this full JavaScript course at Skillshare if your JavaScript knowledge isn't quite up to par. Skillshare is also super affordable with a subscription that only costs 10 bucks a month, but if you're one of the first 500 of my subscribers to click the link below here in the description, you get the first two months free. So take advantage. Hey everyone, Gary Simon of Corsetro.com. So today we're going to be taking a look at 3JS. And this has been a topic that has been requested for me to cover quite a bit throughout the years. Uh, if we go over here to 3JS.org, you'll see they just have a ton of awesome examples that have been used in, uh, to buy 3JS to create these awesome uh, different scenes and you can see that some of these are games some of them are modern UIs I uh, and I'm going to be covering the very absolute basics such as you know how to set up your camera the scene the renderer and also how to get in basic 3d objects how to interact with them through what's called a raycaster uh, and also how to animate them with the help of GSAP, which is Greensock Animation Platforms Tween Max. Okay, so uh, make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet, and let's get started. All right, so the very first thing we want to do is create an index.js. I have an empty folder here, obviously, in Visual Studio Code, a free code editor from Microsoft. Um, here's the folder name, and we're going to hit exclamation point enter to create some quick HTML scaffolding. Uh, we're going to use link enter uh, to get our CSS folder main.css file. Let's create that. So CSS folder and main.css. I'm not even going to use SAS because we're hardly going to have any rule sets or CSS for this. All right, let's get rid of this welcome tab. Okay, so uh, now the um, one thing that I'm not going to deal with uh, just for this tutorial, I want it to be quick and focused just on the topic at hand. I'm not going to deal with uh, you know using any type of module bundlers like Webpack or Parcel. Um, in a real project, you would probably want to use those. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, then I did just re recently release a Parcel tutorial and a Webpack 4 tutorial. So you'll know what I mean after watching those. All right, so with that said, we're just going to use CDNs, our content delivery networks, for uh, the different dependencies that we need. So um, I'm just going to paste those in and hit Control B to get rid of that sidebar. And so I'm going to paste them in just right here in between the body tags. And so you'll see we have three of them. And by the way, you can go to, you can look at the description here in YouTube and click on the code pen link uh, and then click on the settings tab and you go to click on uh, the JavaScript tab and then you'll see these links right here so you don't have to type these out by hand all right so uh, first we have 3js of course we also have this dat gy but I don't think we're actually going to use that uh, so you know what we're going to remove that and all that really allows you to do it's kind of for debugging um, uh, and you can experiment with that it, it works in conjunction with 3js um, you can do that on your own though. Um, and then, so the second one is just going to be tween max right here. All right. So this is from GSAP, which is a green sock animation plugin, and it's going to allow us to, uh, animate our 3d objects pretty easily. So you'll see how the, this comes into, into play, uh, a little bit later on. Okay. So the very first thing we need to do, and we're just going to do uh, our JavaScript right in this file is create a scene and it's basically where all your objects and your lights go so we create a variable we'll call it scene new three dot scene all right so there's our instance of a scene of course because it's a variable nothing's happening just yet so we have to define a few of these things and get some some setup going before we can proceed so next we have to create a camera and there's several different types of cameras that you can use, including an array camera, a cube camera, an orthographic camera, perspective camera, and a stereo camera. And we're going to use the perspective camera because that's the one that most closely mimics uh, the real world and the human eye. 
Uh, in the perspective camera, constructor accepts four different parameters, which is the field of view, or the FOB, the aspect ratio, and the near and far plane. So to do that, we're going to say var camera equals, and we'll say new three dot perspective camera. And then this is where our four properties go in here. So we could say uh, 75 for the field of view. We'll say for the aspect ratio, uh, we could bake one in, but really if we're reviewing this in a browser, uh, we want it to be based on the browser inner width and inner height. So window dot inner width and but, uh, divided by window dot inner height. All right, and then we have our near and far plane. We'll make this one 0 0.1 and then this one 1000, okay? So I'd, I'm, I'm going to collapse all these just because um, I want to save space here, but I did want to separate those out at least initially for everybody. All right, so now next I, we need to set up a renderer. And so these are the, the three primary things that you kind of have to get working uh, and set up for every 3JS project. You have your scene, your camera, and your renderer. All right, so uh, there are a few different types of renderers, just as there are a few different types of cameras. And that would be a WebGL renderer, a CSS 2D renderer, a CSS 3D renderer, and an SVG renderer. Uh, the WebGL renderer provides you with the most flexibility and power to create crazy scenes with no limitations. Um, the other renderers are more simplistic, but still worth checking out for specific use cases. And we will in the future, but not in this tutorial. So we're just going to stick with that perspective renderer. So to do that, we're going to say var renderer is equal to the new 3.webgl renderer. All right, and this accepts uh, different options, and you could check out the documentation for that. Just type 3JS WebGL renderer in, uh, in Google, and you'll find um, the official docs there. But we're just going to pass in one property called anti alias and set it to true. All right, otherwise, um, the result will look jagged. All right, so we're also going to set uh, a clear color on our renderer. So we can do that. And this is just another way of really just saying like a background color. And we're gonna set it to a, um, a hex color code. So uh, E5, E5, E5 is just a kind of like a light gray. And then also we want to set the size of the renderer, all right? And again, the size can be something that you bake in hard code or more traditionally, it'd be based on the window inner width and height. So we say renderer dot set size, and we'll say window dot inner width and window dot inner height. All right, so nothing's happening yet. You can't see anything on the site if we were to look look at it. Uh, so next, we need to append child uh, the renderer DOM element. All right, so that's basically just a fancy way of saying I create our canvas element uh, with our settings, our renderer settings so far. So to do that, we say document dot body dot append child and renderer dom element. Okay. So now if we save this, hit control B to get my sidebar back up, right click in open with live server. If you don't have this option, you have to come over here to extensions, just type in live server, and you uh, click install, you, you can see I already installed it, and then reload, it'll uh, reload your browser, your, not your browser, but your code editor for you. Um, and then you have access to that command. So right click, open with live server, and we have a big old black boring looking scene here. So if I if I refresh this, you can see how every time it I uh, will adjust the the canvas size based on the current width and height of the browser. So for instance, if I refresh it here and I drag it out, it's not responsive. 
Uh, so let's go ahead and fix that. And by the way, we know it's not responsive. Additionally, if we get out the uh, dev tools with control shift I, and we click on this, we'll see the width is 838, height is 873, but if we refresh, it's now 1018, 873. It doesn't adjust those values though for us. So let's make that work. So just underneath here, we put in window.add event listener, and we're gonna listen for the resize event. And we'll have a function. And inside of here, we're gonna say renderer. We already did this before, set size just a few lines above on line 23. And we do the same thing. So we'll just take this and put it in the middle. We also need to adjust, to readjust the camera aspect ratio. All right, so the aspect ratio we have set up right here, but that needs readjusted because the aspect ratio of the browser readjusts as well. So we say camera.aspect equals this time it's not a comma there. We just divide it like that. All right, and then next we have to call update project matrix on the camera every time there's an adjustment that's made. So we just say camera dot update project matrix. Sounds scary, but it's not. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and save this. And now, we could see that these values are now adjusting uh, for the width and height based on the browser, width. All right, so notice these scroll bars. Oh, well, before we get to that, notice that it's black, yet we set that, that clear light gray color. We have to add our, we have to call the render method on the renderer. So render, renderer.render, we wanna render the scene and the camera, save it, and there we go. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Notice these scroll bars though, we want to adjust that, so that's just gonna involve some quick CSS real quickly, and, well, I'm redundant, some quick CSS real quickly. Okay, so all we need is just a, uh, a margin, zero, a height, 100, 100 viewport heights on the body element, and then our canvas element, which is attached um, through a pen child, if you recall, we have to call it display block. So just those two things, and ta-da, we no longer have those scroll bars, vertically or horizontally. Okay, so now let's get to the fun stuff and actually add a 3D object. So 3 us provides you with a lot of different ways to either create 3D elements from scratch by defining vertices or by importing 3D objects or by using one of their primitive 3D shapes such as cubes, rectangles, uh, spheres, etc. So for this tutorial, we're just gonna stick with their primitive shapes. So let's say for instance that you want a sphere. Well, here's how you do it. We'll go back and we'll say uh, var geometry, and before I uh, continue, I want you to think of, you know, every time when you're, you're defining some sort of 3D element here in 3G, 3JS, you have to ask yourself, I when you're working with something that's 3D, for instance, um, uh, let's see here, here's a cup, a coffee cup, right? <laughs> By the way, I don't have this amount of coffee. I haven't had coffee, any caffeine for like the last eight months. This is just water for me, but anyhow, uh, you have two things occurring here. You have the physical shape or the geometry, you know, the actual form, but you also have a sort of surface or a material that's applied to it. So you have two things. It's the, the form and the material. That material is very glossy as a cup, but my hand, this has a different form in the form of a hand, obviously, uh, and also uh, a material, which is skin, not so reflective and glossy. So that's how you have to think about uh, your, your 3D, uh, every time you create a 3D element in 3JS, you define those two things, all right? So var geometry, we're gonna say new, no, equals new, three, and we're gonna say we wanna create a sphere. So that's one of their primitive shapes they offer. And so we call sphere geometry. All right, so 
I I want to go and bring up our browser, the official documentation, the 3JS from 3JS.org. And you can see we have three, or we have sphere geometry here, and it gives you an example. But most importantly is down here we have the uh, constructor, which is the different parameters that uh, the sphere geometry accepts. So it accepts a radius. You think of this as like the size, also the width segments and the height segments. Those are the three that we're going to create. And you'll see I uh, their example, what this might look like right here. And we can experiment with that to see what exactly it's, uh, it means by width segments and height segments. So in here, we'll put one for the size for the radius and then 10 and 10 for the width and height segments. All right, next we have that material. So we got the shape or the form, now we need the material. So we're gonna say var material equals new three and we'll say mesh Lambert material. In here, we're gonna pass in a color for this and this will give us the actual color of our 3D shape. And we'll say zero X and FFCCOO. Okay, so what is mesh Lambert material? Once again, I go back to our uh, documentation here. We see we have mesh Lambert material. Um, if we come down and just type in, or just look real quickly. Oh, what am I doing? We need to type in the filter right here. We type in material. You're gonna see all the uh, types of materials they offer right here. There's a lot. Uh, mesh Lambert material happens to be right here. And it gives you an example of like what the material and, and how reflective perhaps it is. Um, and it, it once again, it, it provides you with all the different parameters that accepts and there's quite a bit. All right, so we have that. So again, we don't have anything right now. We just have our variables. Nothing's being added just yet. The third thing that we need to concern ourselves with is to combine these two into what's called a mesh. So we do that by creating another variable, mesh equals new three dot mesh. And we pass in our geometry first and then our material second. Finally, we do scene dot add, we add the mesh. All right, so if we go back, and of course it's not there. All right, and that is because I have an error update project matrix should be projection matrix. So make sure you update that. Um, now, if we save it now, we're still not gonna see it even though our error goes away, we don't see it. And that's because we need to set a camera position on the Z axis. So if we come back here and we set camera .position Z, and we'll say five, and then we take our renderer render method and add it at the bottom, save it. We will now see that we have a black, ugly looking sphere of sorts. So to fix that and to actually you know, be able to see the color that we set for it, uh, we need to add in light of some sort. So uh, the way we do that is we say var light, and you guess it, there are a lot of different types of lights that you can use. So we're gonna say uh, a point light. And once again, if we come back to our documentation here, We'll see we have our point light. If you type in light over here in the filters, you'll see all the different types of lights, like an ambient light, direction, directional light, hemisphere, you know, et cetera. Um, and this here, you can see the constructor, it takes a color, intensity, distance, and a decay. We're not gonna define all those, just three of them. So the color, we're gonna make it, uh, I think we'll just do white for now and we'll say one for the intensity and distance for 500. And then we're also gonna set a position. So light.position, we set, and this is based on X, Y, Z. So 10, zero, and we'll say 25. And then scene.add, we add a light. All right, and here it is, and you can see that I uh, we have our color. The, the 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 color of the light is white, but the color of this right here is this yellowish 
uh, and that's defined right here in FFCC00. All right. Um, so yeah, now let's go ahead and experiment with adjusting the sphere geometry. So I will take this and we'll say um, the geometries that are up here. Uh, we can try maybe changing this from 10, maybe just to like four. Save it. And you can't really tell that one too much. Uh, if we adjust this four as well, save it. There we go. So the higher you go up uh, is the, the higher um, the vertex count and smoother of a, a circle it will actually look. Um, let's al also um, adjust the camera Z position, if you recall, because we added that up here. So if we put five, let's try put, taking this and make it two. Now it's going to get real close to us. So we're basically uh, moving the camera in. Uh, if we change this something to like 40, it will become a lot smaller. Okay, let's leave that back at five. And now let's say we want to add like a, a cube or something like that. Let's get rid of our sphere. All we have to do is take our geometry and change it from sphere geometry to box geometry. And we're going to say one and one and one. And that defines uh, the X, Y, and Z uh, scale of the box itself. So now we just have a box. And we're looking straight at it so we don't see the side or anything like that. Um, so let's ask, how would we move one of these objects around in space? All right, so we know how to create them and add them. But how do we move it around? All right, so we can come down, we'll just say right there. And we will say uh, mesh. So you don't move the geometry itself. You take the mesh and you, you say, for instance, if you want to move it around, we'll use position. And we'll say x equals 2. So if we look at it now, let me adjust my screen so that we can see what is happening here. Oh, and one thing that we need, I, I want to adjust right now. Notice how when we scale this, I, it ends up distorting the image or the aspect ratio. Uh, even though we have that resize event trying to fix the aspect ratio, we have to make a quick adjustment right here. So just copy that line and we're going to say var render, we're creating a function. And inside of here, we're going to say request animation frame. And we're going to pass in just render. And then also we pass in, we paste in our render right here, and then we call the render function that we just made. So if we save this and we scale it, now we can see it doesn't anymore become distorted. All right, so request animation frame. I uh, basically taken from the 3JS documentation, uh, it will create a loop that causes the renderer to draw the scene every time the screen is refreshed. And on a typical screen, this means 60 times per second or 60 FPS. Now, if you're new to writing games in a browser, you might say, why don't we create a set interval with through JavaScript? Well, the thing is we could, but request animation frame has a number of advantages. Perhaps the most important one is that it pauses when the user navigates to a different browser tab, which is, is ideal because you're not wasting their precious power processing power and battery life. Um, and so basically we're redrawing the, re the renderer every time uh, the screen refreshes and that helps this part of our code work up here for the aspect ratio. Okay, so now that I fixed that and let's get back to our topic of actually moving things around. Um, so you could see we set our position X on two. Now let's try negative two. Now you can see it has moved over here on this side of the screen. Okay, so you can also do Y and Z, of course. So we'll just try, we'll say, uh, let's replicate this line three times. So we'll say Y, Z. This one, maybe we'll just move it up uh, on the Y axis down two, and then the Z back two. So it can't accept negative. So we can even move it forward to two. And you see it's all the way up here. 
Now we can also uh, use a shorthand method for defining all of these by just saying set and then we say two, two and negative two and we'll see we have our results still working up here. All right, um, what about rotation and scale? So we could simply say rotation instead and we'll say 45, zero and zero. All right, so now it's been rotated on the x axis and mesh.scale.set, rather, 1, 2, and 1. So that's x, y, and z. So now it should be longer and rotated. All right, so um, let's go ahead and get rid of those. And what if we wanted this object to actually move, maybe rotate or scale and animate while doing so? Okay, so what we want to do now is within this section right here, we can say mesh.rotation, for instance, dot x, and we'll say plus equals 0 0.01. All right, so what that's doing is it's adding 0 0.01 every time this renderer function is called, and that's like 60 frames per second, essentially. So I... Uh, and we can now see it is rotating on the x-axis. So we can make it go faster. Let's say five. And there you go. So very, very cool stuff that you can do. At this point, let me bring in my, brow my uh, code editor so that we can make adjustments without having to keep on going back to the browser. Okay, so we can also do mesh.rotation.y plus equals, we'll say 0 0.01. All right, very cool. And let's also maybe do mesh.scale.x minus equals 0 0.01. Now this would be a funny effect. Now it's just going to invert itself and keep on growing. All right, so let's get rid of those. All right, we're back to our boring square. Now, if you wanted to perform some sort of complex animation sequence, uh, doing it this way would probably be rather difficult. So we can use our GSAP or the GreenSock Animation Platform, uh, their timeline plugin to help us perform the animations and the animation sequences much more easily. So if you recall, we did import it right here, between max. All right, so what we can do is we can just come down here after renderer and we can say this.tl, and by the way, if you're if you're unfamiliar with uh, GSAP, the timeline max, I do have a tutorial on that, multiple actually. So we're gonna create a new timeline max, and we're gonna delay it just by 0.3 because if not the animation happens instantly and it's shaky so we're just putting like a, a 300 millisecond delay on that so we're going to say this.tl.2 and we reference our mesh so we'll say this.mesh.scale so we're going to scale it initially for a duration of one and then in this object here we're going to put x which is going to scale on the x-axis all right so we'll say two and then we can set an ease. We'll say exponential ease out, just like that. So let's hit save, and there you go, it grows. So if we don't have this delay, I found that it's the animation will sometimes be jagged. It looks pretty good here, but that's fine. Okay, now let's just um, replicate this um, a couple times. So we'll say scale, um, We'll go to 0.5, and then we'll say 0.5 here as well. Uh, we'll do position this time, and we'll say this will last for 0.5 as well, and we'll say x2, that's, just, that's fine too, and then we'll do rotation. So we're gonna get all three in here. So we'll say 0.5, and this time we'll do something interesting uh, on the y-axis. So we'll say math.pi times 0.5. So let's save it. Okay, 
Um, let's also make this rotation occur right here outside of the object. We'll put a comma. We'll say equals minus 1.5. So that means it's going to happen in conjunction. Um, it's going to say uh, it's going to happen 1.5 seconds before it normally would. So let's look at it now. Let's save that. There we go. Very cool. So as you can see, you can use uh, the um, green socks timeline uh, to really create very interesting animations on your 3D objects. All right. So what would, would be really cool is if we could change the scale position or rotation based on some sort of user interaction. So we, if you already know some basic vanilla JavaScript, which hopefully you do for handling events, then you know this should be rather easy. So instead of making this start instantly, what we're going to say is we're going to open up an object and pass in, pass in paused to true. So now this is not going to run anymore because we paused it. So let's say if we want it to be based on like a, um, a click event. We'll say document dot body. So it means anywhere they click, we're going to add event listener. It'll be a click event. And inside of here, we'll say uh, this dot TL dot play. Play method will play this up here. So let me get this out here. So I click anywhere. There we go. Awesome, awesome stuff. Okay, so what if we wanted this animation to only take place if this specific object right here is clicked? All right, so that's a little bit different now. Um, so we have to use what's called a ray caster. And this allows you to determine where the mouse is located on the canvas and determine which object should respond to your defined behavior based on where it clicked or where it hovered or whatever. All right, so in order to do this, we have to first create a couple things and I'll create um, these just underneath here. We're going to say var raycaster is new three dot raycaster. So we got a raycaster instance there. We're also going to create a variable mouse bound to new three vector two. All right. And so you'll see how this stuff comes into play in a second here. So in our right here we're going to change this to uh, window dot add event listener and this time let's do instead of a click we'll just say a mouse move so basically on a hover and also inside of here instead of defining the the logic there we're going to pass in a different function that we're going to define called on mouse move all right so let's go ahead and define that I uh, will go just up here. So we'll say function on mouse move. There we go. And then we'll pass in the event and we'll say first event dot prevent default. This would be necessary if you make like a click event. Uh, so I, I definitely suggest changing this as well to like a click event. We'll do that in a second, though. So we'll say mouse.x equals, and this is coming straight from the documentation. So we first have to get the mouse x position. And instead of me typing all this out because it's a little bit of a, a word salad, I'm going to paste in the x and y right here. So this is how we get our mouse.x and y. All right. Then we, again, this is all coming from the documentation. Then we put in our raycaster. And we set from camera method. We pass, pass in the mouse and the camera. And then we do var intersects. And this is basically going to uh, return a array uh, based on the objects that have been intersected or wherever the mouse is, is, uh, is at, essentially, in the scene. So I'll say raycaster intersect objects scene dot children and true then what we say we do a for loop so foo, for not foo for 
var i equals zero. We'll say i is less than intersects dot length and i plus plus. So you'll see how this is probably real confusing at this point, but you'll see how it works. So let's say, for instance, we want to change the material color or the, the color of the object based on whatever we define as this add event listener as, as mouse move. So what we would do is we say intersects i dot object. And you can console log the object to see everything that you can do. There's a lot. Um, dot material dot color and then dot set. And we can put in our 0x. And then we'll just change it to FF0000. So let's save that. And there we go. So if I refresh once again, boop, there we go. So now we've been able to change some sort of behavior based on our mouse move. What about I, uh, let's say, click? There we go. Clicked it. Okay, so now let's move our GSAP timeline code into that uh, mouse move or the hover event, essentially. Um, so what we could do is we'll take all this, uh, get on my way. All right, so we'll move that. And then inside of here, we're gonna paste that just like that. So, We have to change this dot mesh dot scale. That won't work anymore. Uh, what we need to do is pass in our intersects i. That gives us the current uh, intersected object dot object, and then we say uh, scale. So that replaces this. So we'll copy this right here. Let's just copy um, this part, and then we'll do right there on position and rotation, just like that. So now on a hover, ah, it does not work. Oh, and it does not work because I have paused is true. I forgot to take that out. All right, save that and hover. There we go. Great stuff. Okay, um, so just to make sure that that behavior and that functionality is, is working as intended, we only have one object. So let's add another object, a 3D object, to make sure that that hover is working correctly. So we can come up here, we'll take our object right here, and we'll take these four lines, we'll create another one, and we're going to set the position this time, mesh.position.y, just to move it over by two, save it. So now we have one at the Y2 axis. That one works. That one works. Awesome. All right. So now let's make this a little bit better and, and a bit more like something that would belong on like a landing page or something. So first, let's create a for loop that will generate 10 different cubes or our squares in random places on the canvas. All right. So let's get rid of all this. And let's also uncomment this line and this line. And we're going to create a uh, for loop. But first, we're going to create a property. So we'll call mesh x uh, equals negative 10 just for a starting point. So for var i equals 0, and i is less than, I say, we'll put, we'll put in 15 rather, not just 10. Um, and then i plus plus. And in here, we're going to say this thing right here, var mesh. So we define our mesh right there as usual. And then we'll say uh, mesh.position.x equals, and now we can we can do any number of random things like plus equals, you know, 0 0.01 like we did before. Um, but to make it more interesting and randomized, we can use math.random. All right, and then we can also add some other math to it, like negative or yeah, negative minus 0.5, and then multiply by 10 for instance. And we're going to do this on the x, y, and z. All right. Then we'll do our scene.add mesh. And then we increment our mesh x plus equals 1. All right. Look at that. 
So every time you refresh, this thing is going to change. And they still work. Awesome stuff. Okay, now I want to change the color of these. I think they're um, kind of ugly looking with our current background, especially I want to have text on top. So I'm going to change that real quickly to F7, F7, F7 right here. So now, there we go. It's a little bit more consistent, kind of monochromatic. Now these shadows are too intense. Um, and I don't want that. So what we'll do is first, um, we're going to add another light. So right here, we'll copy that. All right, so for this one, we're going to say the intensity is two. We're going to make both of these 1000. I believe that was for the light distance. Um, also, uh, this one, we're going to say we're going to make this at the very zero, zero, zero. This one, we're going to say zero, zero. And on the X axis, we're going to push it back or into the scene by 25. All right, so let's save that. And there we go. So you can see how this looks right now. Um, if we were to remove this scene, add light, so we still just have our one you'll see how that second light affected situations. So it's a matter of understanding how to position your lights and adjust the intensity for the intended behavior. So if I add that back, save it, everything has become lit up a little bit better for us. So now let's create an H1 element. We'll say three JS rocks. All right, and we'll come down here and I'm just going to paste in a big old rule set here. So position absolute, that will get us um, our, or any of our elements on HTML to sit on top of the canvas. So we'll position it top left right here. Font family, of course, is my favorite monster at. It's installed on my machine. My machine. Otherwise, you would have to import it. Um, it's a Google font. Uh, font size, 70M, text transform with you know, nothing too exciting is happening here. So if we save it and let's get full screen here. There we go. So every time we refresh, because of that random, that randomized nature that we've placed onto it, uh, this changes up. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right, so hopefully you found that useful and now you have some basic ideas that you can really get your foot in the door with 3JS. There's a lot more to cover, uh, maybe like 90% more to cover than what I just did. Uh, so definitely I'm gonna be doing a lot more tutorials on this, so make sure you subscribe if you haven't yet. All right, I'll see you guys soon, goodbye.